Hello, I'm Bob Weeks for Wichita Liberty TV, your weekly source for news, analysis, and commentary about Kansas and Wichita government and public affairs. Broadcast on Great Plains Television, that's channel 26.1. Sunday mornings uh, at 8.30, repeated at 4, and then the previous week's episode repeated at 4.30 after that. You also find Wichita Liberty TV on the internet at my site, The Voice for Liberty, that's at wichitaliberty.org. This episode of Wichita Liberty TV, the old episodes, show notes about the episodes, and all the other content that I and others produce on nearly a daily basis. So. Uh, today, uh, we've got our co-host, Carl Peter John here, just to finish up maybe a little bit of election items and then some other topics that are, I think are of interest around uh, the Wichita area. Um, in the future, we're looking to have all the governor candidates here, and then also uh, individually, that is, and then also some county commission candidates appearing together. So we've got some signed up, but just uh, working on scheduling with the others. And on that election, remember, the last day to register is October 17th, and election day is Tuesday, November 6th. So, Carl, we left our viewers in kind of a cliffhanger last week. There was a recount going on in Sedgwick County Commission, District 4. Uh, Hugh Nix asked for a recount in his race against uh, the incumbent, Richard Ranza. That recount was going on, and now that we know the recount's finished. And it it's finished, and interestingly enough, Bob, we're going to actually break a little bit of hard news, which is unusual because we're basically a commentary and interview program, and that's unusual, but there hasn't been much attention paid to the fact that the recount was completed, the results were certified and sent up to the state at the Secretary of State's office, and interestingly enough, there was no change in the uh, preliminary vote total that was initially approved by the uh, county commissioners in their first canvas the m Monday after the election. So I think that's good news, not only for, well, you know, we obviously supported Richard, Richard Ranza in District 4, so good news that he won, I think, uh, but also that we can have more confidence in our voting machines and our voting systems and everybody now because we had a hand count, 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 and no discrepancies were found. Well, this goes to several questions, but I think the folks who deserve a tremendous amount of credit are the people who are working in the election commissioner's office. And a lot of those folks are basically part-timers. Mm -hmm. You can almost call them semi-volunteers. They're in it for community service. They're not getting paid. It's like minim minimum wage for quite a few of them. And the fact that they were able to perform the election on election day, do the follow-up work that resulted in uh, the initial canvas numbers, and that were re-verified. And with the new election equipment, Bob, they're able to do a complete track by ballot, and they went through it meticulously. There were 39 different groups of ballots, 16 from the advanced votes, 23 from the uh, uh, election day well, tallies. There were about 16 people working more than two solid days worth of work. Well, there were three that, days so. three days to do it. In fact, they, they really put the county commission, who has to certify the results, they had to wait till late Friday afternoon to get it uh, completed, and they had started on Wednesday. Yeah, so I think that's uh, that gives us some confidence. You know, in that race... Um, but let me jump yeah. in, Bob. This is the second time, mm -hmm. using this equipment, that they've had recounts, and the final results after the recount were identical with the count the preliminary count that had initially been provided. And I think that provides some real confidence because yeah. um, obviously with an even closer race for the Republican nomination for governor between the two top candidates, on a percentage basis it was even smaller and the odds of a statewide recount could have been much more likely than uh, the, while the vote total was smaller in the race for county commission and district four for the GOP nomination. It in was sig sig significantly uh, wider percentage basis than the gubernatorial contest. In interestingly, the Wichita Eagle on Friday or Thursday of last week reported that Hugh Nix wanted the recount and it reported that the recount was undergoing, but I never saw anything and I searched quite diligently. They never reported what was the outcome. Well, that's that's true, they didn't and, and just for for the record, I, you know, I contacted the paper and the, the management to raise the question, and I'm a former journalist, mm -hmm. uh, and, and albeit uh, before I moved to Kansas in the 1970s, and I thought it was very strange that they would have an article talking about the desire for recount and then never saying, gee, what happened? Yeah. And uh, they, th uh, you know, private exchange uh, basically acknowledged that they should have uh, 
that was a mistake and uh, they should have reported those numbers that we're reporting now. So if you've been following the perils of Pauline on the Sidgwick County recount, uh, you get your you get your news well, here at KGPT. Well, still report it too. And what's interesting is, you know, first of all, it was a, a, a race where they made an endorsement and a race that received a lot of attention. But then also, you know, there's been some election office bashing by the Wichita Eagle over the past couple of years. And here was some good news that I think people really need to know that we had a very rigorous test of the election office and they came out with no errors at all, yet the... Um, Eagle didn't report that, so that's uh, unfortunate, I think. Carl, let's take our first commercial break for the day. We'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back again to Wichita Liberty TV. Bob Weeks and Carl Peter John here this week talking about some local issues. Um, not a, w a couple weeks ago, I think it was, Carl, the Wichita Eagle editorial board on a Sunday, the big you know, circulation day, important op-eds on those days. They uh, talked about, gee, it's really great that the Wichita public school children are getting a lot more money spent on them this year. And there were a number of things I had problems with with that article, which is, and first of all, they were just very deceptive and incorrect, really, about describing the spending. They talked about how uh, spending across the state had been strangled and choked. Well, I look at the numbers, and since about 2011 for, to today, the total spending and the state spending on a per pupil basis adjusted for inflation, it's a straight line, Carl. There's barely dipped from year to year. So there's not been any huge slash of spending. But then they said they did bring out what the spending numbers were. And the numbers that the Eagle used were base state aid per pupil, which is only about 3,800 or something like that a dollars per year. And it's true that that number has gone down, adjusted for inflation, it's really gone down. But at the same time, because Bay State Aid is just the starting point for figuring how much is going to be spent, at the same time, total state and local spending has really risen by quite a bit. Twenty years ago, um, the ratio of total spending to Bay State Aid was pretty much equal. Nowadays, it's over 1.8 times as much as base state aid is total spending. So very deceptive of the Wichita Eagle to just trot out this base state aid as a representative of all Kansas school spending. Well, you've got to look at the total amount of spending by the, each of the school districts. And also, I think, look at their annual financial reports to have an understanding of what sort of carryover balances they're working mm -hmm. off of. Uh, one of the concerns, and I want to give a lot of credit and a shout out to the Kansas Policy Institute, which has put a lot of the data online for spending. And if you're really interested, get your green eye shades out, viewers. Check out their site to see what the numbers are looking like for whichever school district you happen to be in. Because, of course, there's a, um, almost 300, a little less than 300 school districts in Kansas at the moment, and uh, 10 based here in Sedgwick County. And so even though Wichita is by far the largest in the state and about 10% of the total enrollment, you're looking at a, a whole host of detailed data. But the Kansas Sentinel, uh, give them a plug for their Kansas online. Kansas Policy Institute. That, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that the Kansas Policy and Institute works with. And Sentinel does a lot of reporting based ha on that. Has, has looked at the fact that unfortunately a lot of school districts the money is not going to the classroom. It's going to administrative costs, it's going to uh, non-classroom expenditures. And if that's a concern for you, I think you need to know it and get the detail. And unfortunately, a lot of the reporting, whether it's in the editorial side, like we've talked about with the, the newspaper, or in the news coverage, Bay State Aid is a, only a portion of the picture. The number has, you're right, the number hasn't changed that much, but because so much other funding, whether it's special ed or address students or even some other items like English money, language learners, you know, there's, there's, English there's like second about language. 15 or 18 different weightings that school districts can qualify for. And like the at risk, which is for low income students, is like 45% more money. That's the biggest one right there. So uh, there's that. You know, what also bothered me about this Eagle editorial was they talked about how this extra spending is going to 
is going to make everything fine. And we have to hope, Carl, for the sake of the children and then also getting value for our money that the students do do better because of this extra spending. I don't know if that's going to happen or not, but we have to hope against hope of that. But the other interesting thing is they talk about all the changes that have been made in the Wichita School District, positive changes the past couple years, things like um, starting times and so forth like that. All that happened after John Allison left, and they praised him up and down, but now all of a sudden we're finding out that teacher morale was bad, there were discipline problems, all that under his tenure, and the Wichita Eagle thought he was the greatest thing since sliced cheese. Well, the concern I have, and uh, just for the record, I have, I've got a child who's in USD 259. Discipline and keeping the schools safe is a priority, especially mm -hmm. in light of some of the horrible events, the atrocity down in Florida. That that is a priority. The district's gotten a grant to help protect that, but or to to, to address that. But Bob, uh, I think the real problem goes to the fact that there's not a circle of accountability. And if the information's coming out in terms of morale, but I think keeping the kids safe and the school district had some programs to try and help kids who were discipline problems mm -hmm. and prevent them from kind of becoming a problem and disrupting the kids who are trying to get an education. And I'm, I, I know there are a lot of folks out there who have real concerns that the district's gone in the wrong direction for 259. Now that, of course, is just one district out of the 280 some in statewide. Yeah. But it is the largest and uh, certainly one of the most troubled because of uh, uh, you know, in Wichita, in the center of the city, a lot of poor kids, and we worry about the cycle of poverty repeating itself because these kids are not necessarily getting a good education. You know, we're out of time for this segment, but there is a simple solution, Carl, to allow school choice, to allow competition. That's all that they have to do. They don't have to create the competition. They just have to allow it and not stand in its way, and I think some good things could happen. So. Let's take our halftime break here at Wichita Liberty TV. We'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back to more Wichita Liberty TV. Bob Weeks and Carl Peter John here. And Carl, since we've been doing a little bit of Wichita Eagle bashing, let's do continue down that line. Editorial this week, I believe it was, um, the editorial board wants higher taxes in Wichita. They're recommending a one mill property tax increase to do, well, they didn't really say, but they want a responsible plan for making our city grow. And they have these arguments that the mill levy hasn't been increased in many, many years. And first of all, that's false. It's true that the city has not passed an ordinance that says let's make the mill levy go up, but they've decided to spend more than what the assessed taxable value brought in, and they decide that year after year after year, and over time, that rate does go up, and it well, goes up. It's a rate, that it's not like subject to adjustment by inflation. Inflation kicks in because your home values rise, and that makes your taxes go up along with the increased mill levy. Well, there's two factors to the, what you're raising, Bob. Probably the more, more significant is the fact that appraised value on taxable property has gone up, and so a person who was in, let's say, a $100,000 home in 1990 has, has discovered that the uh, appraiser has come in, and that's a county function uh, underneath state law, uh, and said, okay, the home's worth 140 or 180 or $220,000, and so th that your taxes will go up proportionally even if the mill levy's flat. Now, in Wichita's case, interestingly enough, this goes to one of the flaws in state law, because as a local elected official, we never set the mill levy when we approved our budget. We approved a dollar amount of the budget, and the estimate was, was we believe that this will not, and we'd certified at the state, that was part of the process, that we weren't intending to raise the mill levy. But if the final tax roll came in, and we had a uh, budget of X number of dollars, and that to, to fund X number of dollars required an increase in the mill levy. That mill levy was increased uh, by at the county level, and whether it was the city, the county, or any other governmental unit that was dependent upon a local property tax, that's one of the problems, Bob, because I think local officials should have the accountability 
and the responsibility of setting that mill levy. And mm -hmm. if they don't have it, if the problems come up because there's some factor that comes in, say a tax valuation case goes the wrong way from the government's point of view at, and up in Topeka, and the valuation isn't quite as high, they've got to be able to handle it. And most of the governmental bodies, Bob, have some reserve funds that they're able to pick up a one-time cost like mm -hmm. that. But you know, the, the city council, you know, they just say, uh, oh, we didn't do that, we're just subject to the whims of, of this and that. But aside from that, you know, the Wichita Eagles calling for a responsible plan to make Wichita grow. And I got to thinking, Carl, there's the water walk development in downtown Wichita that we know. Um, about $41 million at least of taxpayer money has gone into that. Uh, the Wichita Eagle wrote one time, the editorial, seven years into a project that was supposed to give Wichita a grand gathering place full of shop, restaurants, and night spots, has failed to deliver. Skepticism is richly deserved. You know, Carl, that editorial was written in 2009. Nine years ago, and not much has changed at Water Walk since then, except Gander Mountain is closed. Well, it's interesting, and that was the center retail piece on that whole project, which I had a lot of people ask questions because the retail piece, it's supposed to be focused on the river, mm -hmm. but the back of the store faced the river. Yeah. And so the Eagle says it's supposed to be shops, restaurants, and night spots. Now, I looked up somewhere else in, in Wichita that has nationally known desirable chains like a Bonefish Grill, P.F. Ching's China Bistro, Red Robin, fine local dining like Chester's Chop House and Wine Bar, uh, fine lodging like Homewood Suites by Hilton, and fine retail stores like Ethan Alli Allison, um, and the city's only Whole Foods market. You know, that's a national chain that people said, we got to have that. You know where that is, Carl Dunn? Yes, that's Waterfront. At, the Waterfront at 13th and Web Road. Besides that prestigious office space, huge office buildings there, many of Wichita's best known companies are there. You know, that was all done without taxpayer help. Some and, years and, and ago... I was going to say, not only without taxpayer help, I was thinking of the, they paid the for TIFs, all of that. TIF subsidy district. They paid for the cost of doing the development and continue yeah. to pay the full load. There's no property tax abatements at right. the waterfront. Like there's a parkway that runs through there, a very nice uh, luxurious road. They built that for $1.5 million and then deeded it over to the city. Now in a TIF district or something, the city would do build that for them and yeah, they'd have to pay their property taxes, but it would go to paying off that uh, road there. So. Do we want more going to government projects like the water walk? I, have, I always get these fouled up. Going to the water walk downtown. Versus or do we the waterfront. Want, or do we want to leave the money in the pockets of people, individuals to spend their own money the way they want, and commercial people who can do things like the water front at 13th and Webb Road, Bradley Fair, New Market Square out in your part of town, those are where we have the really nice stuff in Wichita, and all of those are distinctly not part of the government scheme of things. Bob, I think it would have worked out a lot better if a public auction had been held with the city outlining the terms that they do for the, the property uh, at Water Walk, mm -hmm. and they'd had an auction and let the developers go in whatever direction they wanted to take it, mm -hmm. versus what happened with waterfront where the private sector was allowed to do what they thought best and went through numerous iterations in terms of platting and replatting properties to attract uh, people to locate whether it's a commercial or uh, office or um, professional space in that development. And what's really crazy is we're going to be told before long this is what the city's consultants said, that if we want to build or refurbish a new Century 2 and Convention Center and so forth, that part of it could be paid for by unlocking the value in surplus city-owned property around there, like Water Walk, that we can't give away the property there. And it just it's infuriating to me, Carl, that the Wichita Eagle sits back and says, we want more of this. Let's take a break, Carl. We'll be back in a moment with our last segment of Wichita Liberty TV for today. Well, 
welcome back again to Wichita Liberty TV. Bob Weeks and Carl Peter John, your hosts for today. Okay, let's get off the Wichita Eagle and switch over to City Hall for a moment because um, last month a new television show on KPTS Channel 8 called The Mayor. It's going to be the last Thursday of every month and of course the guest was the uh, mayor and he said, here's what he said at one time in response to a question, he said, three years ago the biggest concern in this community is that we need jobs, 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 he said. And today we need people, uh, saying that we can't fill the jobs that we have today, we need more people. Now, so I, what do I do, Carl? I go to the Bureau of Labor Statistics and look at the data. So three years You're going to conf confuse the <laughs> issue with some facts, Bob? Exactly. <laughs> So comparing May three years ago to May of this year, those are the most recent, at least in July, numbers we had, our civilian labor force down by 1.5%. Now this is the Wichita metro area, not just the city of Wichita, but there's not a lot of economic data available just for cities within metro areas. Plus also, you know, we're regional. That's what they always tell us. We gotta think regionally. Well, the feds do a lot of the data on MSA basis, and if yeah. it's MSA, it's four counties, it's the, Sedgwick it, County and three, and three it's the data Butler, that we have, Butler yeah. Harvey and Sumner. So labor force down, employment down by 0.42%. The unemployment rate was down from 48 to 3.8%, but the driving force behind that is there's fewer people in the labor force looking for jobs. Um, so where does he get that we don't have enough people? Now, that's data from the household survey. There's another set of data from the employer survey, and sometimes they produce slightly different results. And from May 2015 to May 2018, employment was up by 1.0%. So that's good, but the same set of statistics for the nation as a whole over the same time period, up 5.1%. We're which at the bottom. Up. So we're growing at one-fifth the rate. And earlier this week, there was some data about employment for counties, and Sedgwick County has 0.3% more jobs than the first quarter of last year, year over year. Nationally, the number was 1.6% more. So again, there's Sedgwick County growing at about one-fifth of the rate of the nation. And the mayor was beaming with pride at this. Well, I th sadly, there really hasn't been a lot of discussion, and this is another hard news story being broken here at KGPT in terms of looking at the f federal data and saying, hey, we it's good we've got at least a little bit of growth, but compared to the rest of the country, we're falling behind, and that's been true. The national economy is doing pretty well, booming. Well, it's, it's doing much better, and I think Kansas economy, taken as a whole, is going to lag, and Sedgwick is going to be, I think, worse than a large number of other spots in the state of Kansas. We won't be the worst in Kansas, but uh, we normally have been among the stronger mm -hmm. economies in Kansas on a county level, but we are now in a situation where there has not been the rebound in a number of the economics, the drivers of this community's economy, and uh, uh, and even with the announcement and spirit of planning to hire more positions, we're still down thousands of jobs from an aircraft compared to where we were about 15 years ago. And the Wichita State University Center for Economics, um, even after the spirit announcement, it's. Um, its forecast for manufacturing employment was still to decline, even though there were going to be the extra spirit uh, jobs. So, yeah, Carl, I mean, this is just terrible news. No, I don't take any joy in reporting this, but the sad thing is, is Chung Report notwithstanding, and you know, four years ago, the, the Wichita Chamber of Commerce had this chart that says, Wichita economy is bad, we got to have a sales tax to get more money. The sales tax didn't pass, but what did the chamber do? They gave up. There's other ways they could have raised that money. Property taxes, franchise fees, they could have done a lot of stuff, but they just gave up. Well, there were there were proposals out there. I had one mm -hmm. to, to get the county out of the property tax business. It would have given us a unique marketing proposal. Uh, that went down with my candidacy, but, but the, you're right, the whole issue didn't get the attention it deserved Follow, as a follow-up, and the problem we've got, Bob, is I think the uncertainty from the state is driving the state numbers. Mm -hmm. A lot of the national surveys I've seen, Kansas is dropping on any economic criteria, and in some in some areas, we're actually uh, getting down into the 
into the mid to even lower 40s, mm -hmm. which is when you're at the body bottom of a 50 50 state right. or 50 plus one with DC included uh, comparison. So yeah. I think this data is a big caution, but it's unfortunately, my view, being ignored. And if we've got community leaders saying, "Hey, we're in great shape," uh, and and the numbers tell a different tale. Uh, you know, an old joke you know, about confusing me with the facts. Yeah, I understand civic boosterism. Yeah, we're a great town and so forth, but we need to understand. And you know, the Chung Report's done a good job on a lot of this data, but a lot of our leaders do not really take that data to heart, and I'm wondering just how, um, if it's gonna have much impact at all. Well, I think reality can be ignored, but in the long run, it can't be denied, mm -hmm. and the, weak economy here locally, Bob, is going to show up in other ways, whether it's the valuation on taxable property, um, in terms of income, average income data, which will come out also from like BLS. And uh, I think it's important for the community to take a close look and monitor this with being in the middle of election cycle and talk to the elected candidates. Um, because next year we are going to elect a new mayor plus several uh, city council members. Well, we're electing the process in the midst of electing a new governor, 125 members of the Kansas House. Three and, county uh, commissioners in Sedgwick County, potentially. Right. So uh, a lot of stuff going and on. And all the so. other statewide offices. Uh, Carl, they're going to cut off the power here in just a moment if we don't uh, stop talking. So Carl, thanks very much for appearing this week and helping us with your insight. I'm Bob Weeks for Wichita Liberty TV. We hope to see you again next week.